Awesome. So um, I know many of you guys already, and um, I just wanted to give you kind of a brief update on a year in review for 2019, what it looks like in terms of water quality and where we're headed into this next spring. So as most of you um, have heard before or know, fecal coliform and E. coli are both indicators of pathogens in water. When we talk about bacteria, we're mostly talking about these two groups of bacteria. Um, e. coli are a subset of fecal coliforms, although in our waterways in Whatcom County, most of the bacteria, when we're talking about these, um, the fecal coliforms are E. coli. <coughs> and sometimes when they're different, we can use these ratios to think about what sources might be or how long bacteria has been in the water. Um, but these indicators help us, or help the state um, Department of Health decide when waters are safe to drink, safe to swim in, and safe to grow food in. So there's many different sources of these bacteria, right? But mostly we're talking about poop. We're talking about wildlife poop, human poop um, through septic systems and wastewater treatment plants, um, and we're talking about manure um, and a whole, you know, a whole variety. The good thing about there being many sources is there are also many fixes. So that's where the Whatcom County's um, Pollution Identification Correction Program comes in, working with all of these different sources through um, Department of Health managing septic systems and um, urban dog walking campaigns for picking up poop um, to the work that all of you do on um, management practices on um, fields and farms and um, small farms and the list goes on. So I'm going to bring you back to the pool everywhere. If you could pull out your phone and give me a sense of what watershed you live in. So there's a select few here. If you, um, I think many of you are in these watersheds. If you're in a different watershed um, or you don't know, you can answer I. So a lot of variety, and as you keep um, as you keep responding, so um, a lot of these watersheds are sub watersheds of the Nooksack River watershed, which is the larger um, larger watershed that Scott, Ten Mile, Fish Trap, Cam, Bertrand are in. Um, drain watershed drains to the coastal waters, and those of you in Sumas and Johnson Creek know that those watersheds actually drain up into Canada. Uh, but all of these watersheds eventually lead out into marine waters and lead out into areas with um, shellfish growing areas. So regardless of where you are in the county, um, I can be pretty confident to say that there's some water quality monitoring going on in your watershed. Um, so the, um, the pink dots you see on here are bacteria monitoring locations that different agencies or partners in the Clean Water Program monitor some on a regular basis and some just on occasion. Um, the Lummi do their own monitoring on reservation and all of the cities have their own monitoring programs as well. Um, and these few dots that are trickled out in East County, the uh, Whatcom County is actually sampling the forks of the Nooksack River upstream of all these lowland areas too, which is nice. So given those um, monitoring stations and that's bacteria monitoring, I want to take you back in time for just a minute. So in 2015, um, we were ex we saw a downgrade of some of these shellfish growing areas in Portage Bay um, due to poor water quality. So uh, bacteria bacteria was high in the fresh waters in these watersheds and also in the marine waters, um, which meant the state said shellfish aren't safe to eat certain times of the year in Portage Bay. Um, at this time, the, the freshwater data, which, which is what I have here, kind of reflected that marine data. So um, we talk about 200 CFUs of bacteria being um, a comparison for a single sample. And um, below that's good. Above that, we're starting to get into concern. And when we look at above something like 1,000, those are pretty, those are high counts. So um, in 2015, about 40% of the samples were above that kind of 200 cutoff that we use on this is last year's data. So just in 2019, 
75% of those samples fall below 200, and only 25 are above that, um, that 200. So this is, these are signs of really good water quality improvements, and I'll show you that some more. Um, the other thing I like to see is just that really small sliver above 1,000. So that, that percentage of those, really, those higher counts has really dropped down too. So and I, this, is a diff, this is a different way of looking at this. So these are the Nooksack River tributaries. So many of those watersheds, Anderson, Scott, Cam, Fish Trap, Bertrand. Um, and you can see how they change over the years from 2011 to now. Um, so those, that 2014-2015 time period we were looking at, we had pretty high counts um, over time in all of these tributaries, and we've really seen that go down over the last four or five years, which is fantastic. Um, this is kind of where we're at in the last year. We do see that those values starting to creep up a little bit. We've had um, some high counts in a few of the tributaries, especially um, Bertrand and Fish Shop in the last year, but for the most part, we're looking at kind of like a stable trend of that improvement of bacteria. And we can see a similar pattern in the marine water. So this is Portage Bay and the monitoring stations out um, in Portage Bay. So again, we, ha we had that um, 2015 here, 2014-15, um, a big drop off of bacteria as everyone was working on uh, management practices and addressing fecal sources. And we are starting again over this, this last year, see that number creeping back up. Um, so something to be aware of and kind of careful of and just the importance of this really ongoing work that we're doing. Um, this is Drayton Harbor for those of you in the Drayton watershed um, and also just a really good pattern of declining bacteria over time. Gold star. Gold stars. <laughs> Everyone gold stars. So um, that allowed us to celebrate a success this last October, which was the reopening of 765 acres for shellfish harvest in, in Drayton Harbor. And many of you were there with us at the celebration in December to celebrate that with the community um, and Blaine and eat oysters and, um, and just enjoy the work of all these successes. Okay, so um, this graph that I already showed you, this pie chart, so these are the samples from 2019 when we talk about all the sampling throughout the whole year. When we look at storm events or, or rain events, we see a slightly different pattern. So um, whereas most of the year those, those bacteria are looking pretty good, below 200, when we look at just the days that are targeted for, uh, for monitoring that are during and after rain events, um, we see a much greater number of samples above that 200. Um, and so these could be first flush events in the fall, they could be heavy rains um, throughout the fall and winter, um, or winter saturated soils where even a small amount of rain might cause some runoff, um, and then those spring rain on snow events that we, that we know we get. So um, when we look at just those storm samples, 50, about 52% of those exceed the 200 number. So the bottom line here is that rain is still leading to high bacteria or elevated bacteria in these watersheds. And, and you can see that this is the last, um, just last fall's rain, um, rain events. And you can see that it's pretty spiky. We get rain events, you know, half inch, um, up to an inch. Uh, one event at, in, at the very end of um, January with 2.56 inches in 24 hours, so lots of rain. Um, the good news, I'll give you two pieces of good news attached to this. The first is that when we see these um, spikes of bacteria that happen with rain events, um, the magnitude or, or amount is much lower than it would have been, um, say, five, five years ago um, in 2014 or 15. Um, than it is now. So those, those spikes are actually, they're happening, but they're not quite as big, which is great. The other thing is that they're, um, they're flashy or spiky, just like these um, rain events. So whereas in 2014-15, we might have seen a whole season of high bacteria, we're seeing that bacteria come up with the rain events and go back down pretty quickly. Um, it's still happening, which means it's still impacting um, you know, the fresh waters and the marine waters, but it means that it's not lasting for entire se 
seasons, and this is good news um, for water quality in general and shows that the work that we're doing is, is making a difference. So if you're like me, you're looking forward to spring. Um, today's like one of those days. Um, the, the nice thing about spring is that it tends to be a good time for water quality. Um, soils are drying out and um, we get less of those um, big runoff events. Uh, it's also a really important time for water quality. This is the second year in a row that we'll have shellfish growing area open during the spring period, April through June, in Portage Bay. Uh, last spring, we had the reopening for the first time in five years, which is great news. It also means that we have to be diligent this spring. Um, there's going to be a lot of monitoring going on, as usual. And I know um, Department of Health is going to be paying attention um, to this area of the state to make sure that that was um, you know, a good decision to open the shellfish growing areas and that they're being protective of, of human health. So just a time to be um, extra careful about, about um, managing the landscape in a way that's protective of water quality. So with that, I want to give you um, a new tool that we have at the district. Um, this is called CauliScan or CauliScan Easy Gel. Um, this is a way of measuring E. coli in water samples. Um, most of the water samples that we've been talking about so far are sampled by agencies. They get sent to a laboratory. Um, it takes you know, 24 to 48 hours to get the results. Um, they come back to an agency and eventually they'll get posted onto an online map where we can all see them. Um, this new tool is in-house the district. Um, it's a very quick turnaround, just 24 hours. It's all um, free and confidential, being part of the district. Um, it's very inexpensive to us, about $3 a sample compared to lab sampling, which is um, you know, $25 to $30 sample, dollars a sample. So we can take a lot more kind of source ID samples or, or work on, on um, different ditch systems or however you like. So, um, so the great thing is that we have some grant funding right now to do this um, specifically for dairy producers. Um, we've worked with a few dairy producers already that want to um, come out and take these samples. Um, one of the CD staff will come out and it is all happening in-house and it's all staying within the district. It's not going to regulatory agencies or public data. Um, so it's a great way just to kind of get a sense of what's on your property um, and even in these dry times um, we could work with you on that. So, so think about that as a tool and um, with that, the, the two, um, two places I want to direct you for water quality results. So as um, many of you know, you can find the bacteria water quality results online on a handy um, public map. There's also some business cards over on that table that have this link to it. You can go to our website, watcomcd.slash water quality to find this. And, um, and then if you have any interest or want more information about taking these CauliScan samples, um, come find me today or, or get in touch with me afterwards and we can see um, about what that might look like on your site. So um, with that, I'll take um, one question or a couple questions. Yeah. Even if it's uh, months past before stop spreading in the fall, what do you attribute those spikes that were so late in January in the uh, those to find out what those sources are. Yeah, that's a really great question, and I'm going to answer it in part, and it's also a great transition to some other um, research work that we're going to talk about in a second. So um, we, yeah, we will see those spikes in the fall. Um, some of those might be close to applications, but a lot of them, once you get into the, um, into the winter, definitely aren't. Um, there's that's where we start looking at different sources um, with the ground so saturated. That's a time where a lot of septic systems um, have the potential to be failing if they're already you know, challenged or not in great condition. So um, that's a time where Department of Health can be going out and working on sites like that. Um, seasonally, we kind of focus on different, you know, um, whether it's wildlife or um, other small farms, small farms might not be applying manure, but might have you know manure storage issues. Um, so there are ways, and, and Nicole will talk about that in a sec, to 
to take water samples during those times and actually try to better understand what the source is. One more question? Well, if you think of things throughout the day, um, definitely come find me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Nicole. All right, that was actually a superb question. I should have paid you for that one um, for a transfer here. So I just want to give you a few um, updates on projects that have been going on. A big one in particular, two things that we've got going um, that I want to highlight. One was, it would, wouldn't it be awesome if we could put a unit out in the water course that gave us real time E. coli values and nutrient values, et cetera. It would be very, very helpful for us to, instead of a grab sample, to understand spikes and trends and ups and downs. And um, there are these units called ZAPS units um, that we actually partnered with Department of Health, EPA, Whatcom Clean Water Project, and some local um, farmers and landowners to install a handful of these around the county and to test if they actually worked. And they actually, they took in water and with light and math and all sorts of fancy things, tried to tell us um, values for E. coli, nitrate, suspended solids, and a handful of other things. And we deployed six of these throughout um, the county. And you might have remembered me talking about this last year, or you might have heard a little update about it elsewhere. And our goal really was to say, OK, if we get um, different um, spikes and water course um, changes, big rainfall events, or no rain whatsoever, when are we getting spikes? Why are we getting spikes? Um, what do those look like? And these were deployed um, on the Nooksack, on Bertrand, and Double Ditch, and Fish Trap, just so we could look at different water types and courses. We had one at the border to start looking at that. Um, and so we really tried our best um, to really look at these. And so we would also take grab samples from the water and send those to the lab. And our goal was to see, all right, we trust the lab and the results that came back. Are these units displaying the exact same value? That was the goal. Sadly, it didn't work. <laughs> the units don't work. But, um, and so that's good for us to know, right? Sometimes in research, the answer of it doesn't work or you know that's not what we expected is a fabulous result because it really helps us understand what doesn't work and we can keep moving forward to find something that does. Um, so unfortunately they didn't work, they've all been taken out, um, sent back to the company. I think sadly even maybe the company has discontinued those units um, in the, the setting. However, what it did do, it did two super valuable important things to us. Number one, it demonstrated that real-time monitoring is extremely helpful and extremely valuable. And so we're continuing forward with trying to find other variables that might be connected to something like fecal coliform or E. coli, but you have to culture that. You have to grow that, it's the bacteria, and then analyze it. It's very hard to get a real-time measure. But other things like nitrate in water or suspended solids, we can't. So we're trying to find what's really connected so we can get an idea if we're worried about pathogens, bacteria in the water, what's connected that we can watch. So it was awesome and it gave us so much information on when there's no rain at all, we got spikes, we had really high values, what is going on? So we focus so much on rain events and sampling after rain, but we also need to be thinking about what happens in the interim. So this data was shared with the Walk and Clean Water Project, what Meg just talked about, and really opened the conversation, opened the eyes to say, Let's look at all sorts of sources, what's happening out there um, during dry times and wet times and everything else. So very, very valuable for us just to start asking new questions, expand our knowledge, and keep moving forward with water quality. Um, so that was extremely helpful. And again, um, that, that real-time demonstration was really valuable. So we're going to keep on trucking. Um, and we're looking at nitrate sensors right now. We're looking at um, some electrical conductivity work. Department of Ag is doing the same so we can look at certain trends and spikes. And that helps us for a variety of reasons. Um, not only does it help us just look at gener general water quality, but we can look at it during ditch clean out activity, let's say, and see like in the summertime when we're not having a lot of activity but you still have a little water, when they're doing ditch mowing or clean out or big construction projects in town, is that contributing? That's a really valuable result. So if we see a spike, we're not, quote, blaming the wrong source. So really valuable. What we also did, um, and this gets back to that question about, okay, 
if we have a high value, what is it? Like, it's just so hard for us to say there's a high value, we're going to make an assumption, or we're just going to point fingers, right? You guys all are very long time receivers of that, um, and it gets a little frustrating. So, we worked with Exact Scientific and Practical Informatics. Again, the Whatcom Clean Water Project, um, our program on assisting the Whatcom Conservation District in creating a fecal reference catalog so that when a water sample is collected, Exact Scientific and their smart folks um, in practical informatics can analyze that and compare it to a catalog of fecal sources and say what's in there. So this is the goal, and some of you have probably participated in a project, Scott Ditch did a project. I know a lot of the WIDs are talking about doing more of this sampling, and we would like to see it continue. So we participated with them to expand at least that library, if you will, of different sources. We collected over 20 different fecal types to add to that. And we're still collecting samples to improve some of those so that we have a lot of confidence when a water sample comes back and it says, yes for geese, that we can trust that. Or if it says no for dog, we can trust that, right? A yes or a no, we want to be, have a lot of confidence. And we spent a lot of time specifically for dairy um, looking at seasonal effects. So as you might know, your manure is different throughout the year when it's fresh, when it's been held. We wanted to look at those effects so that when dairy comes up, let's say, or lagoon comes up in the sample, we have a lot of confidence in there. And if it doesn't come up, we have a lot of confidence it is not there. So we spent a little extra time really making sure that that profile sample was really good. And we had a lot of help from a lot of dairy farmers. I appreciate every single one of them in those samples. So here are all the samples we took. We took tons of stuff. Um, and it was a very shitty job. Thank you for the giggle. Um, but we did it, and um, there was a lot of a lot of manure collected. But what was cool, without getting too sciency, all I want to tell you guys is that um, the cool part is when when they did their analysis on where all those samples. What we have confidence in is that you want to see this cluster, right? If everything was mixed, then we would say we can't differentiate any sample from anything else. We have no idea what's in there. But that horse was here, the dairy was here, the dairy solids was there, birds were here, humans were here. Gives us a lot of confidence that when we put in a water sample and you get it back, you can tell what's in there. So exact scientific, practical informatics, they're still progressing on this um, technology and really honing it down and improving it, but we're getting there and that was a pretty exciting result. Um, one thing I should also say, if you don't already use the wildlife tracker, or if you use it for a short period, not anymore, this was a tool that we developed, and you can find this link um, on the Whatcom Conservation District website, or if you Google wildlife tracker, Whatcom, um, that you, when you see birds on your property, or a beaver, or foxes, or whatever it may be, that you can actually give us a data point and log that. And um, what it does is it gives us a profile of where wildlife species are, the thing we can't track, the high spikes in January perhaps, roof birds and starlings and geese out in the field. These are things that we're trying to track. What are their timing and migratory patterns? Where are they? So that currently if you get a high fecal count, we can maybe look at this map and say, oh yeah, right now over the last month there's been a huge influx of ducks or birds or squirrels or whatever beaver into this area. And so it just helps us with that wildlife that's extremely hard to track, um, but that we're doing a job here. So this is kind of a community um, tracking and information provision tool, and we're grateful for everyone who helps us um, put more data into here. And it's being used all over other counties as well. It's pretty neat to see that. Um, so as I mentioned, so not only did we buy, build that catalog, but then we tested it against spike samples. So we put specific manure types in water, gave it to the lab, and said, what'd you guys find? And we gave them samples that we suspected a sample, and we said, okay, what'd you guys find? And um, what we wanted to say is, can we find those sources? So when we get a high count of fecal coliform out and about, can we then say, okay, now what is it? What in the world is it? That's really important to us. And the answer was that for the most part, yes, that we could distinguish between certain fecal types. Some still need catalog building. We realized that some 10 samples combined makes a great one, but dogs, oh my gosh, if anyone in here has a dog, you know what they eat, right? And their monogastric stomachs put out things that are all different. So my dog came up as a deer sample, right? Because he eats a lot of deer poop. 
Um, so dog is a sample we're having to build. We need maybe a thousand dog samples to have confidence in that one. So interesting that some different fecal types, and it has a lot to do with their digestive systems. Ruminants are far more predictable than monogastrics are, as you can imagine. Their diets are far more set and predictable than monogastric diets. So um, that was a pretty interesting one. Um, birds were also pretty specific, and that was great to see. That's a really important one. Big question, has been for years and years, so we're still working on that. Um, and again, the goal to provide better understanding of fecal sources. That's where we're going with this, and I hope that the lab continues on this trajectory, they continue to improve it. The cost is a bit high still, that's always a barrier, but hopefully that's gonna come down over time as well. So I know that a lot of folks um, are interacting with their WIDs. I think that's a great opportunity to talk to you about your local area, to get engaged with projects. We're trying to do little bits and pieces as we have funding um, that comes up as well. So I hope to see this work continue. The goal of that, obviously, is so landowners, all landowners, um, residential landowners, farm landowners, non-farm folks, um, understand what's happening, have a little bit better confidence in their good practices that they're doing, can make improvements where it needs to be, and over time, we've got some better water quality and or we can accept that there's wildlife samples we can't do anything about and there's a certain level we have to accept seasonally. So that is also a very important outcome. I also want to just briefly touch, um, we have very long-term studies that we're doing out there on edge of field monitoring. And this essentially is we've got equipment set up at the edge of slopes or fields and up of that, let's say a five acre or so parcel, um, we have a conservation practice, I got it for y'all. Um, conservation practice installed and maybe um, a control there. And right now we're looking at manure um, setback distances. Is 10 feet in the summer okay? Is 80 feet in the winter okay? Does it need to be 100 feet? Can it be 40 feet? So moving around and really testing that out. And it's really helping us understand what's the connection between rainfall, soil type, and soil moisture, and runoff. And we see data like this where we can start tracking when we have the most amount of rain or uh, runoff events. How is that correlated to rainfall? And it's improving tools that we have like the Maneuver Spreading Advisory that hopefully most of you have seen or used. And don't worry, I will remind you of it um, just in case you haven't. So it's really valuable for us. And we're, this just improves the guidance I can provide you on manure application to say, OK, we can go this time frame during the year for this soil type and this time frame for that soil type. And it really helps us get you to customize your manure application. It supports those who already know that stuff and have been doing it for years, but now can really get encouraged and rewarded for that good behavior. It helps others who just say, I got, I got to get it out, and that's that. It maybe helps make a better decision to prevent any issues they may have. So this data set and all the farmers working with us on this has been really valuable, super information, um, informational and very important, and we'll continue to share uh, results of this project out with folks. A few other things I'll just touch on that we're working on. We're working with Washington State University right now on a climate and precipitation model. Our goal there is, Let's say many of you have lagoon storages, right? Um, that's not a practice you install and revise every year or take out in five years. It's a long term, right? If you had that installed 20 years ago and they did it based on the precipitation prediction at that very time, you might be undersized right now. If you build it now, you're certainly going to be undersized in 20 years. So we're trying to look at a model to help us better install long-term practices to maybe fight back when folks say, hey, we have no application dates from A to A, and I can say, absolutely not. You put that in law, in 10 years, you're gonna be out of the best zone. So really, just trying to get this type of information so we can provide the best, most flexible guidance for manure application over time as well, and better practice implementation. Uh, we've got a lot of irrigation water use efficiencies work going on, we're gonna talk about that. Um, here in a little bit in another presentation. And we just had a brand new project um, that's starting um, that I'm collaborating with WSU with Gabe on looking at subsurface irrigation using water control structures. So for those who don't have water availability who want to modify the water that they have to work for them rather than against them, we're going to start testing that out. So we're just right now um, looking for landowners for participation in that project. And lastly, I just want to remind you guys, because if I didn't, I feel remiss about all of your manure application 
um, tools, technologies, and decision support tools that you have out there. So remembering that you figure out your agronomic rate, and I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. You find what is most optimal fields that you've got, test them out. Your biggest thing right now is going to be soil moisture and frozen fields. You want to really watch for that. Um, determining when to apply. Watch the manure spreading advisory. Please check that out every day this time of year because it's going to tell you, you know, when you can apply. It might be high today, but low in two days. Great. You can call the custom applicator, plan ahead. Might be reversed that you, if you're waffling between today and tomorrow, they say, get it out today, get it done, because in two days we're high risk. So this time of year we're really flashy, but you want to find those optimal windows. That tool is going to help you and support your decision. Um, and then there's also a worksheet that you can assess your individual field for those handful of characteristics that make a difference, like I mentioned, soil moisture and so on. Um, and lastly, knowing your seasonal manure application setbacks uh, so that you are have that a bit of insurance policy. This isn't a grass filter strip or anything else. It's just what, how far should I be away from any type of a water body or water course uh, whenever that needs to happen so that I don't have an issue. So um, those are kind of your application risk management tools. And you can find through the manure spreading advisory on the Whatcom Conservation District website, you can find all of these other tools and information as well as if you didn't sign up for a manure spreading advisory, you can do it on there um, at any time. Lastly, speaking of setbacks, we've got a poll. And then we'll get on to the next one. So here's your test. What is your manure application distance right now for February? 10 feet, 40 feet, 80 feet, 100 feet? I should have hidden this one too. I want you guys have like up here. What do you guys think it is? 10 feet, 40 feet, 80 feet, 100 feet? So far, 80 feet, we got a 10 foot. We have an optimistic person out in the crowd. <laughs> By the way, that's not the answer. <laughs> all right, um, well, I appreciate all of you who might have been listening, who know better, it is 80 feet right now. If you want 100 feet, you be safe, you go for it. Uh, but our seasonal requirement right now at 80 feet, it retains that way about into March and then starts shifting to 40 around into March, April, and then into summer is 10 feet. We want you to optimize manure use during the dry period as long as you give us lots of distance right now when fields are a little bit more challenging and wet, rain is a little bit heavier and flashier. So it kind of moves itself during high risk times down to lower and back again. So um, I appreciate that most of you knew that. Whoever this is, come talk to me after. <laughs> it's you, <laughs> troublemaker. Okay, um, so we'll move um, to our next um, segment here. Karina, you want to? Okay, and I'll get your set up. By the way, is there a qu before we kind of move on? Is there a question or two I can take really quick? You can talk to me anytime about any of those projects or tools. I know they were fast. Uh, questions right now? Okay, I'll pull up your slides. We get started. Okay, so on your tabletops and all of that paper, there is a half sheet. It says Whatcom County Working Lands. It's got this logo on it. I encourage you to pick up that half sheet and look at it. So Whatcom County, in collaboration with um, the Egg Water Board, Whatcom Conservation District, and the Whatcom Land Trust, is doing the Purchase of Development Rights Program. This program has been going on for a while but they just got some more funding and they're looking for sites. And so you would be selling the development rights of your farm fields. And so it would ensure that it would, um, would stay in agriculture. Uh, so there's a lot of details on this. You can come ask me questions about it or uh, Becky Snyder's contact information is on the bottom. But again, they pay for the development rights on that property, but you retain the property and continue doing your agriculture activities on it. Uh, so that's a, and the deadline for this round of funding is coming up uh, as February 28th. So if you are interested, please come find me soon or give Becky a call. Um, and again, you can ask, ask questions too. Um, also on your table is a trifold that says fish screening program. Uh, there was some fish and wildlife uh, 
staff that were here last year talking about this program. This year, the Conservation District is taking it on. It's part of the emergency orca whale funding, and the goal being to increase the amount of fish that are making it back down the, street, um, down the streams. So right now, we don't currently have funding, but what I'm trying to do is collect who would be interested in futures funding, and then um, contact you and figure out where it is that you need an improved fish stream, and you would still be working with the staff at Fish and Wildlife. Their engineers would help you design them. I know there's about three or four um, farms that worked with Fish and Wildlife last year to get some self cleaning fish screens, so they're, they they design these screens specifically for your site. They sent me a bunch of photos to put on a slide, but they were all from Eastern Washington, but this is more along the lines of what you would see locally. The upper ones are passive, and the lower ones are those rotary self-cleaning screens. So the next slide, perfect. Um, this is where, in their poll everywhere, if you would text your phone number or email address. It won't show up on the screen. The results are hidden. But I would like to contact you to offer you more information and details. So you're not signing up for the program, but this is an opportunity for you to give me your uh, contact information so that I can reach out. We're trying to collect all of this, uh, all of the potential projects for the 2020 summer season. Uh, this is Oh, no. <laughs> I just tested it. <laughs> All right. So then never mind. But, but now you can still text Can you, can they still? No, just find me afterwards. Okay, find me afterwards. Don't, don't sign up right there. <laughs> uh, but again, this is for, if you contact me um, in the next month or two, hopefully, sooner rather than later, this is for funding that would help you install screens this summer. Um, and so. Please do come find me since that didn't work. Sorry. And my contact information is also on the back side of this flyer, so you can take it home with you. Even though it says Fish and Wildlife Everywhere, um, we're running it, so I put my card on the back. 